there's racing cars. Erwin Racing is now live. Want to get rid of that? We're live, we're not sideways. Saxon, can you see if you can get me back on there? Just give me the thumbs up to tell me that we're not sideways. And as soon as I know that, I'll start talking. Let me know. We're waiting to see whether we're sideways or not. Feeling reasonably optimistic here. The big question. We're not sideways. Okay, we're all good to go. So, my name is Dr. Arna Rubenstein, and I would like to start tonight by paying my respects to the Indigenous people of this land. We are uh, on the land of the Iraqi people of the Bundjalung Nation, and I would like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, and it is a great pleasure and honour to have with me today Dr. Katrina Wallace, and um, uh, one of my most uh, eminent and decorated guests that I've had so far. Uh, Katrina is a specialist in artificial intelligence and actually was the founder of Flamingo, Flamingo AI, which is an Australian uh, stock exchange listed company. And she's only the second woman uh, ever in Australia to lead a company onto the ASX um, as a woman uh, CEO with a woman chair, which is amazing. And she's the, um, uh, also the, the founder of the newly uh, launched uh, consultant advisory business, um, uh, Ethical AI. Uh, Katrina's won multiple awards. You're actually quite an amazing uh, woman with the list of awards you've won in Australia and around the world, including being um, uh, recognised by the Australian Financial Review as one of the most influential women in business and entrepreneurship, and multiple other awards all over the place. So it's a fantastic pleasure to have you tonight here with us around the fire, Katrina. And um, my name is, I'm just Arna Rubenstein, and I'm the uh, CEO of the Rights Passage Institute. And tonight we're going to talk about um, a number of things, including crisis leadership, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, business, where business is going, um, the changes that are, are happening as a result of this pandemic. We're going to look at uh, as we always do, rites of passage and some of the things that are happening from the rite of passage framework uh, at the moment. We're going to talk about parenting. You have uh, three of your own children and, and another two children who you've brought up, bringing a total of five and some recently uh, um, not adopted, but you know, some more stepchildren in there. So you have extensive parenting experience. So it'd be great to hear about your experience with parenting in this time. Uh, we'll be hopefully answering some questions and, and giving people some takeaways. So Katrina, I would like to start, you know, here in Australia, we've had a number of crises in the last six months with the uh, massive fires, which I know you were affected by, and obviously what's happening with the coronavirus. And we've been talking about this idea of leadership in this time of crisis or crisis leadership, and it would be great to hear your both experience and some of your uh, insights into that topic of crisis leadership. Great. Thanks, Sana, and it's uh, such a delight to, to be with you and the audience tonight. So my interest in crisis leadership came through personal experience with the summer 2019 bushfires where we had two family properties that were uh, deeply affected. So a farm, 10,000 acres, that was incinerated by the fires in November and December. So through that process, I became interested in understanding how Australia was leading through um, the crisis. And if we think about what crisis leadership means, it's the ability to minimise the impact or effect of a crisis before, during and after the crisis has occurred. So I started researching and wrote a, published an article along with Stephen Kakoulis, the economist that was recently published in Yahoo Finance, identifying what the crisis leadership behaviors were, where we really failed as a country uh, to do that well in the fires, and then what they should be. And what was very interesting as we were writing this on the back of the bushfires, you know, soon came the floods straight after the bushfires and then sure enough, 
COVID-19 in, in the crisis that we're in now. So I think that the crisis leader behaviours that we uh, identified are hugely relevant to not just being in crisis uh, before, during or after, but my belief is that crisis will be the new norm. There will be different types of crises. So whether they are environmental, whether they're economic, whether they're health crises, whether they're social crises, this will be the new norm for us. So I think it's hugely important that people start to know what these crisis leader behaviours are. And I think they're highly applicable to politics, government, business, but also managing families. So as you mentioned, I have a um, large number of children, also been in, in isolation. And I know a lot of families that are in lockdown or isolation will have gone through crises of some sort. So they may be uh, simply just having the family at home under one roof. It could be that they've lost a job. It could be financial crises. And I, and I think these um, behaviours are very relevant. Okay, great. And and um, can you please um, give us some insights into what are some of your observations as to how the crisis management has been handled um, that you've observed so far? Yeah, sure. So in the research that I did, uh, was looking at analysis of politicians, state government, federal government, local government, but also I, I researched uh, residents who'd been affected by the fires, so particularly the, the Rosedale Beach residents where we also had a, a family property that was affected. And so I was able to identify five stages of crisis that occur. So one is uh, signal detection, two is prevention and preparation, three is containment and control, four is recovery, and five is learning. So they're the five stages of crisis. And really we didn't see, in the, in the bushfires, we didn't see the Australian government really step up until recovery, and, and we're now into learning. But before we got through recovery, of course, uh, COVID-19 arrived, and we have seen, I think, improved behaviour of, of our leaders based on COVID-19, because the signal detection phase was easier to do uh, this time because there were a lot of other countries who'd gone before us, whereas the fires, uh, the government should have really recognised years before the fires happened that they were they were coming and there was plenty of people indicating that to them. So if I go through what the crisis leader behaviours are, they are uh, seven core behaviours. So one is signal detection. So the ability to know and recognise signals before the crisis occurs. So on, on the bushfires, we, we had our Indigenous leaders warning the government, we had our ex-fire commissioners up to two years before the fires warning the government that summer of 2019 was going to be devastating, was largely ignored. I think it's fascinating for COVID-19 that we had Steve, um, not Steve Jobs, uh, Bill Gates, doing a talk about five years ago, absolutely predicting that in 2020, we would be hit by a, a devastating virus. There were many medical uh, experts and scientific experts who were predicting that this would come. So again, signal detection, not great, but I think the government is managing it far better than the fires. Just so, before you go on. Yeah. Could I ask that in your discussion of crisis management and crisis leadership, uh, very interested if you see any difference between how women in positions of leadership have dealt with crisis leadership compared to men, if there's any observations that you've seen there? Yeah, that is such a, a great question. So we are, and, and look, as we go through this, I'm really happy that if the audience wants to ask questions and have they got a process to do that? Uh, yeah, hopefully we can get some questions through. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, so very, very interesting, this whole notion is, is, is there any gender difference in, in capability around crisis leadership? And there's been a number of articles published recently and, and also a whole paper by Harvard Business Review on how women are really stepping up to show very um, adept skills at crisis leadership. And the two uh, role models they use is the Prime Minister of Finland and then the Prime Minister of New Zealand, both female leaders who've done an exceptional job in uh, managing uh, their crisis. So we see associated with what's called the feminine archetype uh, are these type of behaviours. So collaboration, 
deep empathy, compassion, ability to be multifocal, being adept at collective action, so able to mobilise large groups of people towards one um, outcome, uh, absence of ego, um, absence of needing to play a political gender, and most importantly, being visionary. So these things are not exclusively associated with women leaders, but women leaders uh, have been shown to be quite adept at this. So as a result of, as, as one of the outcomes of this period of crisis that we've been in, and Australia being in multiple crises, I hope that it really gives the opportunity for women leaders to come forward uh, and also you know, support or, or lead uh, the future of, of our country. I heard actually that the Prime Minister of, of Finland had a press conference just for children at the beginning, you know, early on in this, uh, in the coronavirus, that she actually, you know, spoke to the children of the country. I mean, what an amazing and fabulous uh, thing to do, and and you know, almost an, you know, a no brainer. Someone speak to the children, and, and she actually, you know, did that, which is fabulous. And you know, and watching Jacinta Ardern and how she's been, how she's managed it, and and that absolute toughness and close the borders early and and I think New Zealand is now down to uh, no cases or, or very very few cases which is extraordinary yeah great okay thank you um, and so you know within crisis there, there are a lot of things that still keep going and there's a there's obviously been a big concern around the economy and and business and 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 you know you've won awards uh, in Australia, I believe you're in the Australian uh, Business Hall of Fame, the Telstra Business Hall of Fame. Uh, is that correct? Uh, that's that's pretty close. That's pretty so. close. Um, and, and you know, it's been a big part of your life, and and you've been a great inspiration to many people around that. And there's no doubt we are seeing, like so many other things, a transformation in business at the moment. And it'll be really fascinating to hear from you you know, where you're seeing business going and what changes uh, are happening at the moment. And, and I'm interested in whether, you know, which changes you think are sort of uh, temporary and which ones are more likely to persist. Yeah, well, it is a, a massive time of transformation coming on the back of a shock to uh, the economy and to businesses. And we know that in the US they're predicting about a quarter of the businesses there uh, small businesses will will not reopen after after COVID, which is which is you know a devastating statistic. But what we know uh, with regard to businesses and how they're going to transform and change uh, 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 into these types of things. So businesses that have a high level of of these capabilities, we will see um, do very well. So the ability for a business to pivot the ability for them to have good business continuity, so that is uh, disaster recovery processes, uh, those that have uh, flexible mobile and cloud-based technology infrastructure, those who have an emphasis on security and cyber security, those who have a strong level of analytics in their business and who are looking to automate business functions such as using artificial intelligence. Uh, and those who have the capability to enable home-based work. So they're the types of uh, characteristics we'll see businesses start to develop and the businesses that go on to do well will have those characteristics. Now, interestingly enough, the businesses that are doing really well, there's about six or seven um, types of businesses that we're seeing really thriving at the moment. So, uh, and this will be very obvious to, to the audience, but it's quite interesting. So it's anything to do with food and uh, food that's being delivered. So pizza is huge. It's in fact probably the business that has grown the most out of everything in the world. Pizza. Pizza. So uh, in the US alone, Papa John's has put on, I think it's 20,000 new workers and Pizza Hut has put on 30,000 new workers. So that's the, the food business. We've seen, and I know uh, Woolworths in Australia was putting on tens of thousands of workers as well. And then uh, the delivery business. So Amazon is putting on 100,000 new workers because they're in, in the business of retail and 
delivery. So that's uh, huge. We're also seeing growth in medical uh, and healthcare and wellness related uh, industries, anything around communications and collaboration platforms. We're seeing a boost in online retail and we will see anything that is can enable home-based work, which will be probably the biggest change uh, historically that, that we've seen because we've been predicting home-based work will come for many many years and it just hasn't ever really landed but it has now so those audience members who are thrilled about working at home that it's great news because we're likely to see these hybrid models of where people can work at home and uh, and in the office or completely at home and I think that's uh, great news for some and probably not great news for others. Mm. Thank you. And, and I got a comment from Fran here. Um, and, and it's interesting, one of the businesses that's really boomed definitely up in this area in Byron Bay is the nurseries and the, um, uh, you know, the sale of compost and soil and everybody's planting veggie patches and fruit trees. And, you know, how fabulous to see more and more people actually, you know, taking it seriously around growing our own food at home. So, there's another business that is definitely booming at the moment, uh, and and in fact we have some, I have some uh, some some fellas who live here on the property, and they've just started up a a business uh, building uh, garden beds and veggie patches for people. So by the way, anybody living in Byron Bay, I've got some good looking strong young men here, super keen to build veggie patches and garden beds and plant fruit trees. So if you're interested, please message me. Um, and also apparently pet grooming is going mad. Right. So our friend Janet in Sydney, also if you're looking for someone to do your dog or your cat or any pet grooming, uh, let us know and we'll put you on to Janet who we can uh, vouch for as being a fabulous pet groomer. <laughs> and by the way, if you have comments or questions, things that you want to ask, please put them through. I can see them here and if we can get uh, uh, Dr. Wallace to answer those uh, or some of them, that would be really great. Now look, we can't speak to you without talking about artificial intelligence, AI. You're one of the uh, leading people in the world uh, uh, around uh, the growth of, of AI and understanding of AI and, and you consult uh, around that um, and you've just launched your business around ethical AI advisory, which is you know unbelievable and it would be really fantastic to hear from you a bit about AI, even starting with just telling simple people like me what AI is, how you define it, and, and its role in business, and uh, you know just what you'd like, what you would share there. Great, of course. So artificial intelligence has actually been around for a long time. So the the term was originally coined in Dartmouth University in 1956, where some computer scientists recognised that technology or software could mimic human intelligence. So that's essentially the definition of artificial intelligence. One of the main types of artificial intelligence is called machine learning. And machine learning is the ability of the software to learn on its own account without needing human intervention often and without being explicitly programmed. So it just learns from each task. And that's what makes AI so powerful is the ability for it to learn and to perform decisions and actions that can hopefully assist humans. So artificial intelligence has come of age in the last you know, five years because of a couple of factors. One is the computational power is now strong enough to drive the um, algorithms and, and the machines. And also the existence of big data is uh, is there so is able to use that big data to train the algorithms to perform in certain ways. Can you just explain big data? Uh, yeah, so big data is just um, uh, huge quantities of, of, of data, can be anything, can be images, it can be words, sentences, documents, uh, anything that can be labelled and then a machine or an algorithm trained to learn from, from that. And obviously Facebook is powered by AI, um, uh, Salesforce, the, the Salesforce automation tool um, by AI, a lot of social media platforms by AI. In fact, AI in the next two years um, will enable about 80% of all technology type applications. So artificial intelligence is currently the fastest growing tech 
sector in the world. So just in the last 12 months, $38 billion have gone into artificial intelligence. And we will uh, expect that to grow about 300% over the next three to four years. So it is uh, prolific. And it's been compared, the coming of AI has been compared to the same effect as the introduction of electricity to the industrial era or the invention of fire back in the, the caveman days. So we're really terming the, the era that we've just arrived into um, the fourth industrial revolution, and it'll be powered by, by artificial intelligence. And my belief is that will bring great things, and that will also have uh, quite a dark side. So I'm, I'm very happy to talk about what I think it'll do well, if that's if that's of interest, or, or also how it might play out in this current crisis. Yeah, we'd love to hear about those and as well about your new advisory, Ethical AI, and, and, and why you've started that and what you're hoping to see happening as a result of that. Great, yeah. Well, look, the main applications of artificial intelligence will be to um, what we call augment humans, so to help humans do things, or to amplify existing systems, but also potentially will replace humans. Now, I know you and I have talked in the past about the side of AI where artificial intelligence will, will replace jobs. And what, we, uh, what Gartner, the technology analyst, predicts is that in the next 12 months that 1.8 million jobs will be replaced by robots and machines rather than humans. And this is in particular is in industries such as financial services, tourism, hospitality, retail, uh, um, telecommunications. Uh, interestingly, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, industries are already the ones that have been affected by COVID-19. So well, coming out of this crisis, we will probably see a lot of these business leaders looking to automate functions in these industries rather than hiring humans back into that. So 1.8 million jobs eliminated. One of the really, I think, worrying parts of that is it's predicted that 90% of the jobs that will be eliminated are the jobs of women and minority groups. So we start seeing AI play out a bias here that is quite, quite disturbing. We also know that 90% of the jobs in AI are held by men and only one in 10 jobs held by women. So again, we start to see um, the potential for conscious or unconscious bias starting to, to creep into how AI is going to be programmed. Now, one of the uh, interesting things is that AI, ethically, there is no real laws or rules that govern how artificial intelligence um, is being done. So even my company that makes uh, software that is, acts as uh, non-biological brains or subject matter experts or information systems that support uh, employees, uh, there's no real laws or regulations that govern how we build the technology. So I've been working closely with uh, Minister Andrews, Karen Andrews, and also the Human Rights Commissioner, Ed Santo, who uh, have delivered, um, both of those government uh, entities have delivered the uh, ethical AI framework last November by Minister Andrews' office, and then uh, Ed Santo, who's just a champion of, of our Human Rights Commissioner. I know Ed is deeply worried about the negative effects that artificial intelligence will bring, have released um, numerous papers on the human rights aspects of, of AI. So I kind of sit where a lot of the big AI thinkers are. And, and if you think of someone like Elon Musk, who is one of the most prolific producers of artificial intelligence, he says about AI that summoning AI into our lives is the same as summoning the devil. Um, Stephen Hawkins says you can't control what you don't understand, so AI will never be controllable. And it's predicted that we're only about 20 years away from the time of singularity, and this is a term that many of the audience members will have heard, but maybe not everyone knows what it means, which is a time when the, the machines are actually no longer need the humans to run them and they're actually smarter and more, more capable than the humans. So all of that to me is quite worrying as well as the bias that is often built into the machines because the algorithms are trained on historical data and that historical data often 
is a reflection of the current biases that are in society. So often women and minority groups aren't well represented in, in, these, um, in these applications. So that was enough to get me thinking and, and being concerned about it. And given there are a few laws or regulations, uh, that was really what prompted me to set up and launch the business Ethical AI Advisory. And the purpose of this business is to support organisations who are doing AI start to think about how to do it ethically so it can be done for good and the harm is minimised. It's a big topic. There's a lot in that, that's for sure. And, and we have a question from, uh, from the audience around whether AI is involved in, or the, you know, in the current COVID-19 virus, how we're using AI around how we're managing that. Yeah, well, it certainly is being used and the COVID app that came out that I think um, I know of yesterday, it was about a million uh, Australians had signed up to it, that, that will be an AI-based app. Uh, a lot of the analytics, the predictive analytics, the, the monitoring will all be done by AI. Uh, very smart countries such as South Korea. Uh, Korea is one of the most advanced digital countries in the world. Um, they used, I think they did a rapid testing of 200,000 uh, people when the virus started using smart AI-based technologies. So we will see AI being used as uh, analytics. We will use it being used to do diagnostics. So very soon, there's no doubt we will see a diagnostic tools where you just need to um, cough or um, do something in your smartphone and the smart uh, the device will be able to tell whether you've got some some type of sickness. These apps already exist. There's a great um, app called ResApp that does uh, exactly this now, not not necessarily for COVID, but for respiratory tract infections. So we will see a huge boost in AI going forward and use of it, hence why we need to make sure that it's done well. I've got a very interesting question here from Ashley about what is the potential for AI to correct its own bias? particularly around replacement education and retraining? Yeah, that's a really insightful uh, question. There certainly are mechanisms by which the AI can uh, correct its, its own bias, but, it, but it's often extremely difficult. So we use uh, these terms uh, black box AI or white box AI. And if you think about an artificial intelligence machine, it's based on a com complex neural networks or neural nets that uh, learn and uh, sort of collapse and rebuild themselves over and over again as they learn more and more. Now, black, black box AI is when uh, a data scientist or an engineer has no ability to explain what the algorithm has done because it's kind of got a life of its own. And white box AI, which is certainly the, the AI we build at Flamingo, is uh, able to, you're able to very quickly open the machine up and see what decisions have been made, how the algorithms are behaving, and it's very explainable. So going forward, uh, I hope most people who are in businesses looking to do AI will insist that their vendor has white box AI. But to, the, to answer the question, there are AI that govern and control other AI, which uh, would uh, be a way that um, that question would be answered, that there is AI that can start to detect when there's bias in the data. But the very best uh, approach is to actually eliminate the bias in the data before the data is used to train the algorithms. Now, a great example of this is, is recently, and uh, that was with the Apple Card. So Apple released its, uh, its Apple Card a couple of months ago. It was backed by Goldman Sachs and it had algorithms trained on historical data. So when it went out and there were people who are husband and wife applying for the, with the same financial information to get credit, on average it gave the male, the husband, 10 times more credit than it gave the wife. And Steve Wozniak, who is the co-founder of Apple, he did it as well, his wife and him, same level of um, income and uh, finances, and he got 20 times the credit that his wife did, and that went viral, and it was a very embarrassing moment for Apple and Goldman Sachs. But that is because the bias was in the data that was used to train the algorithms. And this is a massive problem. 
And I often give an example for audiences if they don't understand kind of this bias to do a few quick exercises um, on their phone, which I encourage the audience to do um, perhaps later or while you're watching this. So if you Google unprofessional hairstyles and hit images, you have a look at what comes up there. If you Google best CEOs in the world, uh, Google most intelligent people in the world, hit images, you'll start to see what's coming up and I, I won't give it away because it's the cool exercise to do and the one I like to do so I'm a professor um, adjunct professor at the uh, Australian Graduate School of Management so I'm, I'm a professor really good if the audience could also google professor style and see what comes up and you'll you start to see that the bias is already in the technology that runs our lives that our children are using to learn it, it's already there the train has already left the station so when we talk about unconscious bias, it's really baked into everything and... Um, Already. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It's, uh, it's very enlightening to hear what you have to share. And um, we could sit here for many hours and discuss it. Um, I'm going to change it up slightly and, and uh, talk about uh, some of our um, things around rites of passage and... Um, We'll, we'll hear from you a bit more around um, parenting and, and any other comments you want to have about this. But um, uh, each week when we do this, we, we have been discussing the rite of passage framework and how this idea, we've been talking about the uh, coronavirus pandemic being a, a rite of passage and having the three stages of a rite of passage of separation, transformation, and then eventually return or reintegration and we all separated we've separated from our everyday lives and we're in our homes and in our in our sort of our bubbles um, and we've been going through a transformation process and within transformation there's we talked a lot in the couple of weeks ago about stories and the importance of sharing stories for building communities and passing on knowledge and we've heard some fabulous stories from you tonight about AI we talked about how there's a challenge always within a rite of passage. Um, and if we jump ahead, eventually this transformation stage is going to end. Eventually it will end and we'll go back to life. And it won't be life as normal. It will be different, but we will go back. And, and here in Australia, already they're starting to open up the schools. Um, so there are schools in Western Australia where everybody's gone back to school as of today. And people are starting to be able to visit houses more and there are, um, you know, some of the work things are starting to change. So uh, I've definitely noticed that there's, uh, in Australia, people have relaxed a lot and are, and are going out more and the streets in Mullumbimby here are busy and, and people going back to school and, you know, we're starting to think about, oh, you know, we're, we're, we're moving back into this, uh, into a place where we'll be, you know, back in the world again. And on a personal level, I've been really quite stirred up by that because it feels like we've just sort of gotten used to and settled into this being at home more and being with our families and being on the land or, or whatever it is. And, and now we're looking at, at, you know, we can feel somewhere in the future we're going to be going back to, to work and the office and everything like that. And the third stage of a rite of passage is a vision a vision for how we want to be. And I guess the thing that's really come up for me strongly is this idea that it is so important that what has happened to us during this time of lockdown, that we can somehow capture the insights and the, and the experiences that we've had and take them into the future. Um, they, they did an interesting survey in England and, and we were going to find out what newspaper, I think it was The Guardian, uh, where they asked people about their experiences from this lockdown and what they want in the future. And 91% of people said they didn't want to go back to life as it was before. Um, and, and that one of the th extraordinary things is, is what people have seen just from being home and their children not going to school and being around them all day. And I was speaking to someone yesterday who was talking about how once again, there are gangs of children on bicycles riding around the local streets together. And another person I was speaking to in Western Australia today said how he spent a few hundred dollars and bought a basketball ring. He and his 18-year-old son are at home and he bought a basketball ring. And he said it's, it's in the street outside. <coughs> and it's been extraordinary to see 
how many people from the street and how many children have been out there using this basketball ring. And it really seems like so many people have had experiences, despite the challenges in this period, uh, around being with their families and being at home and, and around, you know, I was speaking to another person today saying how much she has enjoyed being at home and not having to drive around the whole time, not having to run the children around every day, not the, the, the I think she described it as the insanity of the busyness of her life. And, and so many insights that we've gained and how can we capture these things so that we don't find ourselves one, two, three months down the track and nothing's actually changed. Um, and I've been really thinking about that a lot and I'd, I'd like to ask you the question, you know, in this period of lockdown, what have you noticed? What's been different for you? What, 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 what uh, things of joy have you realised from having to change from your normal everyday life, which I know involves an enormous amount of travel and, and you know, insane busyness. Mm. Yeah, well, the real things that I've observed is um, slowing down but not necessarily producing less, and that's quite, quite extraordinary. Um, I, I am a very busy person. I do a lot of travelling. And the business and my life is progressing probably better than it did before, but I'm less busy, I'm, I'm quiet and I'm slow. And I think there is something to be, to be said about that. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is that I see a return to some core values, but I've got to be careful not to say we're going back because I don't think we are ever going back. And and it's not necessarily that we are returning to old fashioned values because I, I'm one who's always kind of looking forward, but there are certain values that are coming forward that I think have been buried for a while. And I think this is family and uh, connection. And, and given that I build robots for a living and I'm all about automation and digital, I see that this is a fabulous balance to that because there is I think now a greater humanity and there will be greater human uh, connection as a result of this virus and the uh, accompanying lockdown and isolation that will match the increased use of technology. So I think that's uh, fascinating. I've also really enjoyed um, the time to be creative, which I've, I've never had before. So I'm writing a book with some fabulous professors at the University of New South Wales on AI and ethics. But it's also given me a time to reflect on that this is not a great time for everybody. And there is many people where this transformation will have been extremely painful, uh, whether they've lost job, whether they're suffering domestic violence, whether their children uh, have challenges at home. So I'm very cognizant that this is not a great transformation for, for everybody. And some people are doing it extremely tough. But what I do know, what I do believe will happen is that we won't go back to how things were and we won't go back to old fashioned values, but we will go forward. And I hope there is a reduced consumerism, a greater awareness of the environment, a greater appreciation of family, uh, no need to be flying like me back and forward to the US and burning a whole lot of carbon on the way. And, and we start actually living better as humans on this planet. I think this is a big step in that direction. Great, thank you. And, and I think it's worth noting that one of the superheroes of this particular period has in fact been technology and things like Zoom, which have allowed us wherever we are in the world to keep in touch with our loved ones. Um, you know, my parents are in lockdown in Melbourne. Your mother is in lockdown in Sydney. And um, as a result of Zoom, we've been able to have, uh, you know, video calls with whoever uh, we want to. And, and, you know, there are groups of people who have been having calls. And that, that has been a truly extraordinary um, element of this period of time that we're in. And, and then what about with your children? So, you know, lots of children... Uh, in your world and, and I'm interested in um, how this period of time has impacted there and, and uh, anything you'd share about that. Yes, yeah, so I have the five 
five children. So my two stepsons, Jake and Dan, live in Brisbane with their um, their partners, uh, and also um, Dan and Ruby with a little baby. So. What we've been able to do is, uh, even though we, we haven't physically seen them, we're doing a lot more communication with them um, online and through Zoom, which is beautiful. And in fact, we all meet as a family once a week, extended family, and we're pretty much only interested in Bobby the baby, to be honest. Um, but what a beautiful way of um, uh, getting closer to the family. And, and I'm, I know human connection is really important, but I'm also a big one on digital connection is a thing. And, it, and it's not just a traditional thing around social media and teenagers that sort of connection but now all age groups uh, even our very elderly parents right down to a baby bobby who's only a few weeks old able to connect digitally i i, I think it's a real thing then i have um two of my sons who have been uh with me in isolation and what has been extraordinary beautiful is to see their transformation particularly the younger one um uh, Saxon who is uh, around 16 and a half and uh, seeing him struggle initially but really step up and, and move through the, the difficult times and then another son I have Hunter who I have seen how he's transforming his his business and his his world and 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 going through that as as we are uh, all here together and and we're now sharing that because we live on top of each other and we can we can hear that so uh, that's that's been an absolute privilege as a mother to see how uh, these young men have have gone through it and then indigo my daughter uh, has come and recently spent a week with us she's been doing isolation away from us and that was me that was really hard for me I didn't like to be separated from her but she's stepped up as a beautiful young woman and going to university and and getting through this and I've, I've really seen the best uh, come out in her as well so as a parent I think it's a great privilege that I am so close to my children and watching them and and supporting them and them supporting me which just wouldn't have happened if this hadn't happened Thank you. And, and one of the things I've had a number of people now speak to me about is that there are also a number of parents who for the first time are really having to look after their own parents and support their own parents who are uh, in, in isolation and, and very seriously in isolation because they're in high risk groups uh, and that, that in a very short period of time, uh, you know, some of the elderly parents who are still active are now at home not going out and you know there are there are many parents who who you know say our age who my parents are 89 and 90 and you know they're at home and and we've had to support them to be there and I'm very happy to be able to say that my mother and father 89 and 90 had a lesson on zoom and have taught themselves how to do video conferencing and that's a fabulous thing and they can contact us and and also the grandchildren and uh, including my son Jarrah, who's in London, who can contact them, and, and that's brought a lot of joy into their lives. So um, we've got a few minutes if there are any more questions, if people want to type out. And, and while we're waiting for that, I, um, I would really like to encourage people to um, join our uh, Rites of Passage community group on Facebook. We're interested in supporting me, as many people as we can and, and creating a, uh, a community conversation and finding out what it is that people want to hear about. And one of the big questions that uh, someone asked us last week is they wanted to hear about business. And so it's fantastic that we've had you on here uh, today, uh, Katrina. And uh, also we've got from the Rites of Passage Institute our... Um, Parents and Children Growing Together in a Time of Crisis e-course, which is a, a seven-part uh, uh, program that people can do at their own uh, speed, and it's designed to help people find a way of um, regularly checking in with their families so they can monitor their health and well-being and, and sharing stories and looking at challenges and how they can creatively work with them and creating a vision for the future and, and recognising the, uh, the gifts, the talents and the genius uh, in each person within the family. So uh, if anybody's interested in that, please check out our website, the rights of passage institute.org. Rights spelt R I T E S, rights of passage institute.org. So just checking whether we have any uh, more questions coming up here. Um, May I just, uh, while you look at the questions? Absolutely. Yeah. 
Because so, <laughs> I have so many children, uh, I uh, have neglected to say that I have other beautiful step children uh, or children in law. So this would be Jaden and Lindsay, who have also had time with uh, during this isolation and have started to develop beautiful relationships with uh, people that lived interstate but now are close to us and uh, I can't tell you how valuable that time with the extended family has been. Uh, this has been just a, a, a beautiful opportunity to get to know them. And then my other child-in-law, uh, Jarrah and Kate, a little bit further away, but uh, uh, beautiful to, to start to spend more time with them uh, soon as well. Great. Thank you, and very lovely to hear you share that. Um, so there are no more questions coming through, but the thing that I really want to share and, and, and I really um, urge people is to, to spend some time thinking about and talking if you're with someone uh, watching this about what are the things, what are the special things that have happened during this time of lockdown? Yes, there have been challenges and there may well still be many challenges to come. But, you know, we heard Katrina speaking so beautifully about the time with family and, and, and getting to know new members of the family. Um, and for other people, it's going to be someone's been writing in, a friend of mine, Dylan, about the garden and how much he's loved being in the garden and also the pottery wheel that he's had and the opportunity it's given him for his creativity. So, you know, what are the things that you have done in this time that you normally wouldn't get to do or that you've seen in a different way? What, what's brought you joy? What, what, what have you seen that you want to move towards and and also what have you seen that you don't want to go back to doing you know how do you want to change your life how do you want to make this transformation positive for you for your family and for your community because this is a rite of passage a transformation will happen and the actual challenge and question for all of us is how can we make it the most positive transformation possible rather than a traumatic event and, you know, definitely in part, that is up to each of us. So please, please spend some time thinking about that. Please send us in um, some, some comments and some notes around that. And if you have questions that you would like us to answer in the future, more things that you would like us to talk about, we'd be very happy to do so. Please share this um, uh, Facebook Live event if you feel it would be of interest to other people we, we really want to build a, uh, a community, we want to support you as much as we can, uh, our sort of aim and what we say at the end of each one of these is let's do this well and let's do this together and I really want to thank my special guest tonight Dr Katrina Wallace, it's been fabulous having you here by the fire and interviewing you and I'm going to leave the last word to you Thank you, Anna. Well, uh, it's been such a pleasure and a privilege to be here to speak to you and to your audience. Uh, beautiful night. Not sure whether there was anything else that you wanted to disclose about us sitting close together. Well, it is interesting that you're talking about getting to know your relatively new stepchildren who have the same name as my children. So, yes, there is definitely something in that. And we are able to not socially distance, which is very, very special as well. I'm a very lucky man. And, um, you know, this conversation that we've just had for an hour, I'm currently about four and a half years into the conversation. And I did say at the beginning of, I did say on all the, um, the posts that I put out that it would definitely not be boring. And it certainly hasn't been boring. And uh, so thank you. I still said I'd let you have the last word. I'll let you say goodnight and then um, Saxon will uh, end the uh, coverage for us. Great. Thank you. Well, I just, uh, my, my words really to the audience is to know that uh, crisis is, the definition of crisis actually means uh, an, an unveiling or a turning point. And I think we should treat the crisis, this crisis as, as a turning point and, and an unveiling of the unknown. Uh, but what is really important to do is to know that crisis leadership can be done 
in business, but also in home. And, and I'm very happy, perhaps we can share, I've got a paper on crisis leadership that actually goes through all the behaviours. Very happy to share that with um, put in the, comments the audience. Yeah, yeah for sure. Absolutely. Um, so thank you very much.